think of milk and bread, for example, being more important than perhaps some other lines. So I don't think it's necessarily the case that if you have conversations with a supermarket that you're talking about necessarily adjusting the price uh, for the producer, you could be looking at what margin is being uh, achieved on particular uh, more well, essential goods. When we talk goods. to supermarkets, so, they say they have to buy things in advance. Do you know what that was? That was the Radio 4 talking about price controls. And that's absolutely by the playbook, the inflation playbook. Government mistakes 101. Ah, it's all right. There's plenty of room for me and you. So, yeah, so what happens is government prints too much money, purchasing power of money goes down, prices go up, consumer prices go up, government brings in price controls. It's happened many, many times, it happened from, from the Romans. <laughs> this is always the way it goes down. They try and, try and bring in price controls. And what happens is that that ends up further distorting an already distorted market. So, in other words, market that's already being forced to put its prices up because its input costs have gone up because the purchasing power of its the money's gone down. So it's squeezing their profits. So they have to put prices up, and then uh, the government then comes in and says, "You can't put prices up because we want you know we want to be popular with the." public and the public vote for us and uh, they want cheap bread. So then what happens is you then get a thriving, I'll tell you what the next step is, okay, if you want to know. The next step is you have a thriving black market where people who, let's say, I don't know, let's say, for the, make the maths easy, say it costs five pounds to produce a chicken and the government says you can only sell a chicken for four pounds then what will happen is they'll sell two or three chickens just to make it look like they're complying but then the vast majority of their chickens will come off the market and they'll get sold uh, on the black market for five pounds or six pounds or whatever you know because there's a general shortage of chickens in the supermarkets so price control never works because what you're trying to do is you're trying to buck the market you're trying to car we could have passed there couldn't we there's a nice sort of fat parking space there and that car just drives straight through didn't slow down one mile an hour exactly like me outrageous so yeah so you know I'm always saying that you know when I was a boy I learned about the Industrial Revolution and I was a bit sad that I was never really gonna live through anything like the Industrial Revolution and then along come the uh, computer revolution so you know if anything uh, ended up seeing more innovation uh, through technology from computers than than uh, James than Wright and uh, uh, what's his name guy who built the uh, the road the steel uh, the railroads and the bridges Jeremy Clarkson's hero Anyway, it'll come to me in a minute. So, um, Brunel. But uh, then, uh, you know, you learn about the fall of the Roman Empire and you think, oh God, you know what, that must have been a weird period in history to have lived through that. And then all of a sudden you find that you're, you're stuck in the middle of the fall of an empire, the American empire, the, the, the dollar empire. The whole thing is turning to you know what. They just agreed another uh, extension to their debt, their, their debt, which is their, you know, the amount that they exceed, their spending exceeds their income. The accumulated amount by which their spending has exceeded their income, while at the same time insisting that they've never defaulted, the Americans insist they've never defaulted on their debt, whereas in fact they have actually defaulted at least four times, uh, you know, 74, 34, uh, uh, 
greenbacks, war bonds. They do all the time. And yet they continue to say that, well, they never, you know, the full faith and confidence in the American blah, blah, blah. We never default on our debt, which is, which is, as I say, is a lie. And also uh, we, uh, we always uh, pay our bills. And um, all they do is they just print money to pay the interest on the money they've already printed. So uh, 10 years ago, it was, it was clear mathematically they couldn't uh, get themselves out of this debt trap. And it's even more clear now. The, you know, I mean, I think they've gone past the point at which uh, they really care now. You know, all they just care about is, uh, is printing more money. So that, that's a market now where, I don't know, by the time you view this, saying it's a year time, you're, you're looking at this, maybe the interest rates have started coming down again. <laughs> inflation's not falling because interest rates are below inflation and you know the uh, all the time interest rates are below inflation it, it, it uh, incentivizes people to, to spend rather than save whereas uh, if interest rates are above inflation then it incentivizes people to save rather than spend so we're still uh, the wrong way around on that interest rates below inflation but that's because the government which is the major you know borrower can't afford to pay the interest on if it went much above well even three or four percent let alone five or six or ten or twelve percent which is which is you know what might be required and so let's just talk a bit about being like disingenuous okay <laughs> let's talk about saying that you want one thing and then actually wanting another and the poor old public that's struggling to make sense of what you're saying can't work out why things keep getting worse. So, um, let's take inflation, for example. The government says, well, we're, we're trying to get inflation under control, which, now, if you know anything about inflation, you'll know that with inflation at 8, 9 or 10% and interest rates at 4 or 5%, that's not trying to get inflation under control. That's actually, that's actually like trying to not to put a fire out by just splashing a bit of water on it from time to time, just not putting it out, but just, just you know, keep sort of dampening it down a bit. And the reason is that the government wants inflation. They've got themselves up to their neck in debt. They can't pay it back. They can't tax people sufficiently to get the money to pay it back. They don't print any more money to pay the interest on what they've already printed because that just makes the situation worse. And so what they need is a healthy dose of inflation. You know, the economy's not gonna grow its way out of debt. There's so much debt, the economy's never, never gonna grow. In fact, it's, hard, it's having a problem growing at all, let alone growing faster than the debt. So, you've got no uh, prospect of inflation really coming under control and the government not really wanting to bring it under control until, you know, it costs 9,000 pounds to buy a ham sandwich. So expect inflation to stay high and it'll stay high until the government decides that we've had enough of it or they've had as much as they need and then they'll, you know, they'll bring it down a bit again. So that's, that's one reason why, you know, that you're saying, well, the government's saying one thing and then another, and they seem to be powerless. They seem to be powerless to, to do what they say that they want to do. And that is because behind the scenes, they're actually peddling hard in the opposite direction to make sure that what they say they want is not what they want. And therefore, it's not what is going to happen. And you can take the same with um, immigration. Now, the, uh, the various uh, schemes, National Health Service, uh, pensions in particular, uh, are... A massive Ponzi scheme where you pay uh, the, the current uh, people, uh, uh, the current beneficiaries, out of the money which is being paid in by the people who are the current contributors. It always was like that. Uh, it was designed like that. Um, and that was because when they set the whole scheme up in 48 or wherever, 
they didn't have any money to pay pensions. They said, we're going to pay an old age pension. And everyone was like, well, where are you going to get the money from? Because these people, they're going to be deemed to have paid in their entire lives into a pension. Whereas, in fact, they haven't because this is year one. So, so they said, well, don't worry. We'll pay the people who are due a pension now. We'll pay them out of the, the money we get in this year. And it's always been like that. They've always paid this year's beneficiaries out of this year's contributors. Now, the reason why that's Ponzi-like is because if the number of beneficiaries goes up and the number of contributors goes down, then you're stuck, aren't you? Because you're paying out far more than you're getting in. All the time you're getting in more than you're paying out, you're laughing. And not only that, you're hoodwinking the public because the public actually have got this quaint old fashioned notion that they pay into something all their life and they are then entitled to draw out of it, that, that may, they may, they're drawing back their own money. Whereas in fact they're not, they're drawing money, the money of the people who pay in this year. So <clears throat> now, of course the government did get into trouble because of the boomers like my generation who are now all retiring and uh, are sort of quite a large cohort and they don't really have enough young people in work to pay all our pensions. So what are they going to do? Well the answer is they have to find themselves a large number of new young taxpayers, right? <coughs> now Short of a national breeding program, which I'd be quite happy to support, to be quite honest, but short of that, where are they going to get all these young people from? And the answer is they're arriving in boats every day. <laughs> people who, if they can only be got into the, the tax system, if they can only be given identities and the right to work and a national insurance number, etc., etc., will be able to um, contribute towards the, the public services which are, have no reserves backing them up. You know, nothing's ever been saved to pay the benefits that were promised. They have to be funded out of current income and the more young people we get in this country, the more current income they'll have. So really they're just trying to preserve this Ponzi scheme, keep it going a bit longer. And that's why you've got uh, this, this hypocrisy about uh, oh no we don't want you know when, <laughs> when Boris Johnson vowed to reduce immigration we had we had a net 200,000 people coming in every year and then the, la the last figure show a net 600,000 so that I don't know how his maths work but as far as I'm concerned I, that, that's not a reduction as far as I'm concerned 200 up to 600,000 so but so that again it explains the ineffectiveness of the government's policy on immigration. It's because privately they want immigration, in the same as privately they want inflation. And so what will happen is that you can bet your life that no effective measures will be brought in to reduce uh, net immigration. Now, the the flip side of that, of course, is that immigration is, is as Barry Cockroft, and I'll come back to him in a minute, would say is totemic, which was, a, you know, sort of a in phrase at the Department of Health when they were trying to screw everybody. If they screwed everybody too hard and they went on strike or started blockading oil refineries or something, they would say that, oh, that is just totemic, you know, we have to tip to, which meant, it didn't mean that they couldn't do it, it just meant that they had to back off from that a bit, you know, just pull back from that particular issue, press ahead with all the others, but they would pull back from the totemic issues until all the furore had died down, and then, then they would push ahead with them again, and, and then the furore very rarely sort of flared up twice. So it's, uh, it's just a, a phrase that means, well, you've gone too far. So immigration for the in the UK is totemic. And so They've got this um, tension between needing new young people taxpayers and the existing, the incumbents, uh, the residents of this sceptred isle, um, not, you know, again, getting pretty fed up with um, uh, not being able to um, get a doctor's appointment, not being able to get a scene in A&E, not being able to get their children into a, the nearest school, 
um, you know, all, all the competition in supply for services. So, uh, Mr. Cockcroft, who I have, I believe I have referred to in the past, uh, was the chief dental officer during the period at which most dentists left the NHS. And, um, you know, I think I may have maligned him. I think I may have uh, inadvertently given the impression that I think he was an incompetent fool um, and that that was a bad thing. Whereas, in fact, it occurs to me, or it occurred to me this morning, that uh, I may have misjudged him, and uh, for which I'd like to apologise. And uh, the reason is that uh, the all these people that are going on strike because they want more wages, because the purchasing power of their wages has gone down, which is an entirely reasonable thing, um, Are, are forced to go on strike because they have no alternative. There is no real sort of private sector alternative to the railways. There's no private sector alternative to the uh, nurses, you know, or the, the junior doctors, etc., etc. Whereas with dentists, we are in a way we are privileged to have a pretty, pretty burgeoning uh, private sector. So, and there are two reasons for that. The first is that uh, when they set the NHS up, the uh, governments were, were too tight to sort of purchase the dentist surgeries and everything and put the dentist on a salary I think because it would have been ended up being too expensive they they already they, they, they privatized all the doctor surgeries but the doctors on a salary but they didn't do the same with the dentist so the dentists ended up being self-employed subcontractors to the NHS and uh, uh, which stood them instead in later years because it meant that they had a, a choice and then the second thing that was a, a factor, a big factor, I think now in hindsight, is the fact that at, 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 some, at one point the whole thing hung <coughs> on a knife edge, which was that if the government had, at that point, when all the dentists were leaving the health service, said, "Look, guys, uh, you're either in or you're out. We, you know, you can't have half NHS, half private." We want, if you want an NHS contract, you have to be fully committed to the NHS and then we'll, we'll reward you on the NHS. And at that point, the dentists, I think, who were like mostly NHS, but perhaps five or 10% private, they might have said, well, in that case, okay, we'll go, we'll go for a wholly NHS contract. But Cockcroft didn't take that approach. Basically, he said, no, you know, as far as I'm concerned, the NHS is more than capable of competing with the private sector. We've got all these lovely benefits, you know, you can get, uh, <clears throat> you've got the NHS pension, which is brilliant, which is easy. And uh, you've got the, uh, you know, you can get uh, discount tickets to see Elton John at the Can and Canterbury Cricket Ground, but etc., etc. All these benefits. So we don't care. You want to go private? That's fine. We don't care. <laughs> and so in doing that, in accepting the sort of the plurality of systems, he gave dentists a, an alternative market, something else to do other than be on the NHS. And as a result, um, we don't need to go on strike because we can go into the private sector as a result. And so Barry, if you're listening to this, or your solicitors are listening to this, then I'd just like to say thank you for that. Because, because I still think you're incompetent but in, in that particular instance, your incompetence worked really well for, for the dental profession. And so, uh, so I think you deserve the credit for that. And I'm happy to give it to you. All right? Okay. Nice to talk to you. Bye.